Right, so let me begin then and uh, tell you that what I'm going to do tonight, it's a kind of overview of uh, what is a subject I've been working on for quite a while. And it resulted in basically three different papers that I'm trying to put now together. You will see that my main claim has three different aspects of it. And I'm going to try to tell you what do, in what way they matter and how do they connect together. But in order to uh, do that, let me start with a small introduction, which is a kind of story. So the story begins with one of those letters that was addressed to the Royal Society by people wanting to join the Royal Society in the 1660s. A letter from someone called Samuel de Fermat, the son of the famous Pierre de Fermat, to Henry Oldenburg, the permanent secretary of the Royal Society, who we understand from the latter has written previously to Samuel de Fermat, presenting what they are doing in London to this French philosopher and experimentalist in France. De Fermat is writing, I thank you, sir, most humbly for the kindness you manifested in letting me learn of the fine plan of your or illustrious academy, which will doubtless work with profit at the increase and perfection of the sciences. Although I have not seen its history, um, he's referring here to the Spratt's History of the Royal Society, which appeared in 1657, you have written me enough to enable me to understand its object and the means by which you wish to arrive at it. It appears to me that the inductive natural history of which Bacon spoke somewhere and which he put among his desiderata is not far removed from your aims. And what he called experiencia literata or the hunt of pan, the natio panis, the letter is in French, but he's quoting it in Latin as well, is not very different from the methods you use to reach that end. So here is this French correspondent of the Royal Society wanting to join the society. And in his introductory letter, he is kind of flaunting his familiarity with Bacon's terminology and somehow connecting the kind of experimental activity he believes that our society is doing with this technical term of Bacon, experiencia literata, and this mysterious expression, the hunt of pan. Samuel de Fermat is himself an experimentalist. He knows his bacon quite well. And this here is uh, actually is a, is a reference, is a quote from one of Bacon's famous works. So the Experiencia Literata or the Hunt of Pen figures prominently in Bacon's The Augmentis Cientiarum, which appeared in London in 1623. And here you have the so-called sort of interesting French edition published the year immediately after 1624 and very much uh, read and valued by the uh, scientists, let's say, philosophers, natural philosophers in France. And the reference to Experiencia Literata of the Hunt of Pan is from book four of the Augmentis Cientiarum. Here is how it goes. Uh, the art of indication has two parts, for so I call it, so it's a Bacon is attracting our attention that he's inventing terms here. For the indication either proceeds from one experiment to another, or else from experiments to axioms, which axioms themselves suggest new experiments. The one of these I will turn term experiencia literata, learned or literate experience, the other, interpretation of nature, or the new organon. But the former, as I have hinted elsewhere, must hardly be esteemed an art or a part of philosophy, but rather a kind of sagacity, whence likewise, borrowing the name from the fable, I sometimes call it the hunt of pan. So, experiencia literata, or the hunt of pan, the named borrowed from the fable. And as you can see here, Bacon is kind of compressing in one paragraph all the technical terms of his projects. 
uh, of his project, the Novum Organum or the Interpretation of Nature, all these arts of indication and this interesting and weird experimental literata or the hunt of Pan. And he's describing how they relate to each other in the next lines. Nevertheless, as a, as a man, sorry for that, as a man may proceed of his past three ways, he may grope his way for himself in the dark. He may be led by the hand of another without himself seeing anything. Or lastly, he might get a light and so direct his steps in like manner when a man tries all kinds of experiments without order or method, he's but groping in the dark. But when he uses some direction and order of experimenting, is it is as if he were led by the hand. And this is what I meant by learned experience, experiencia literata. For the light itself, which was the third way, is to be sought from the interpretation of nature or the new organ. So this light metaphor is telling us that mere experience, the empiricism, doing experiments is a sort of groping in the dark. Light is the new organ or the interpretation of nature. And the thing we are looking for, the experiential literata, is in between these two things. We are in the dark, but we have someone guiding us and leading us by the hand. This problem of indication, the arts of indication, are at the center of Bacon's philosophy. And here you have the title page of the Novum Organum, which has a subtitle, the Indicia Vera de Interpretazione Nature. So the Novum Organum is also an art of indication. And the whole project of Bacon is finding helps and instruments and indications and organizing these instruments into some form of art which means techne practical knowledge, but for Bacon, practical knowledge is always a counterpart of theoretical knowledge. And these uh, are supposed to kind of correct the intellect, intellect, direct the distorted mind, and help us on our way to truth. And there are two arts of indication, the literate experience and the novum organum. A bit before Samuel de Fermat's a letter to Oldenburg in 1640s, someone has translated Bacon's Augmentis into English. Gilbert Watts, uh, here is the title page of the Advancement and Proficient of Learning. And to help the reader make a sense of what Bacon is really doing, Watts appended to this book a number of, probably, uh, a number of, of um, how, do, how shall we call them? probably trees, if we think of Petrus Ramus, Ramus trees, or just general schemes of organizing Bacon's questions and problems. And you can see that as part of the logic, these are the divisions of logic, there are four intellectual arts, they don't need to concern us, we only deal with these two arts, which are the arts of invention, literate experience, and the interpretation of nature. Now you can see them better, and you can see that literate interpretation has a number of things there, and this is the par paragraph it refers to, literate experience or the hunt of plan, they can insist on the hunt of plan business, treats of the methods of experimenting, the met methods of experimenting proceed either by the variation of the experimental setup, or the production, or the translation, or the inversion, or the compulsion, or the application, or the conjunction, or finally, the chances of experiment. None of these, however, extend so far as to the invention of any axiom. For all transitions from experiments to axioms, or from axioms to experiments, belongs to the other part relating to the new organ. So here are some features of the experiential literature. Experiential literata is a method of moving from one experiment to another experiment. We assume that this is happening in the laboratory by avoiding the typical errors and biases that we are always prone to. Uh, this move, however, is an analogical move, which is done without the interventions of axioms, because as Bacon is saying, there is no inductive generalization involved or no hypothetical deduction 
effective method. So it's not as if I'm experimenting, I'm inferring the hypothesis, I'm testing the hypothesis. No, apparently I'm just moving from one experiment to another by some form of analogy. Hence, it is not a science properly speaking, is not knowledge properly speaking, is more like, and they can say, the kind of sagacity. Sagacity is a feature that hunters, hence the hunter fan, share with dogs. Dogs are also said to be sagax. It's a kind of, let's say, call it by modern terms, tacit knowledge or expert knowledge or craft knowledge or something like this that the experimenter has and the experimenter can apply in moving from one experiment to the other, lacking accents or trying not to get involved into too much theoretical speculation. And there are seven modes or ways of governing this analogical move. And all these um, ways or modes have something to do with the experimental methodology, just think variation, I'm not going to enter into the details, but by variation of experimental parameters, you can generate new experiments from old experiments anytime. An extension is a way of taking your results from one field to another field. So you obtain some results, in an experimental results in a particular field, and then you export them in another field. And in the past year, some papers have been written on this experiential literata. It's kind of among Baconians uh, a nut still to crack, although some of us have tried our teeth and broke some of them in this thing. And of course, uh, my question tonight is, why do we call this the hunt of fan? What can we learn from Bacon's insistence to call it a hunt of fan and from Bacon's followers' insistence or emphasis on keeping this strange name for it? As I said, there are three sides of this problem. And um, they somehow are very much related. I'm going to disentangle them tonight. And it's, from now on, it's a kind of cherry picking because there is a bit for each. For the historically oriented philosophers in the audience, there is a bit of history in it because early modern science used the language of fables. So, uh, pan nature universe, uh, pan, pan is a kind of thing that many people have used, you will see. And so it is the idea that there is a similarity or there is a kind of model of knowledge similar with the hunt. And people who are not historically minded or oriented are usually saying this is just a metaphorical way of speaking. And my one of my purposes tonight is to show you that it's more than a metaphorical way of speaking, although I never understood what that means. And I'm going to discuss a bit about uh, how other people have used this um, allegory of fan and uh, in what way Bacon was innovative with respect to them. For those of you who are more philosophically minded, uh, we are in the center of a very deep philosophical problem of fact, talking with sense about discovery. And uh, in a recent, relatively recent history of the scientific revolution, David Wooten claims that um, the emergence of early modern science is strongly connected with the emergence of a language of discovery, and this happens around Bacon and <clears throat> in, in many ways in connection with Bacon as well. But there is a more general question that we can ask today about understanding or modeling discovery. And my claim here is that we will see some of the problems that are familiar to his, the philosopher of science today in Bacon's attempt to describe uh, this art of communication. And last but not least, probably I won't get into this uh, feature or side of my problem, is the historiographical problem, uh, which relates to the big question how to read early modern texts, what are the missing codes of reading, maybe we have never understood the text properly because we never understood in what kind of context we should read it, they are missing context, and here I have a sort of methodological proposal of how to read text. So let's start with history, which is usually the place where philosophers are going to sleep. Um, the standard story of the scientific revolution, still, is that somehow early modern philosophy begins with a break with the past. 
and the Cartan company replace all this allegorical language and the so-called humanist way of reading with something different, maybe something more geometrical. And where examples seems to refute the standard story, they are taken to be a sort of reminiscences of the past. That's in the following example, which is from Newton. So Newton, in the famous classical scholia, namely manuscript, manuscript editions, plan to be published with the second edition of the Principia, also dwells into this pan business when he wants to kind of describe what means that bodies act on one another at a distance, gravitation. The ancient philosophers, as it says Newton, who held atoms and vacuum, attributed gravity to atoms without telling us the means, unless in figures, as by calling God harmony, represented him and matter, by the god Pan and his pipe, or by calling the sun in the prison of Jupiter because he keeps the planets in his orbit. So Pan is kind of representing universe, and the pipe of Pan has also an important role to play in, Bacon, in, uh, in Newton's classical scholia. And there is another paragraph there to the mystical philosophers, Pan was the supreme divinity inspiring this world with harmonic ratio, like a musical instrument, and handling it with a modulation. So the, pa the pipe of pan, having seven different tubes, it's modeling the universe, which has seven planets, and there is also correspondence with the uh, music of the planets, and so on and so forth. Here it is in Newton. The, of course, the image is not from Newton. I'll tell you uh, at some point what is this image about. It's from a book of fables. Now, Bacon also has a lot to say about Pan, and he does that in a book called The Sapientia Veterum, on the wisdom of the ancients from 1611, so a good 60, no, almost, almost a, a century before Newton. Uh, there are pages and pages of how we should understand that Pan signified the universe, and here is, for example, a quote which describes the image I showed you before. The body of nature, nature being pan, is most elegantly and truly represented as covered with hair, an allusion to the rays which all objects emit, for rays are like the hairs or bristles of nature. And there is scarcely anything which is no more or less radiant this is very plainly seen in the power of vision and no less so in all kinds of magnetic virtue and in every effect which takes place at a distance. For whatever produces an effect at a distance may be truly aid to emit rays. But Penn's hair is longest in the beard because the rays of the celestial bodies operate and penetrate from a greater distance than any other and so on and so forth. And that's the place where usually <laughs> philosophers are just closing down Bacon's books are uh, going to read some nice Descartes or Kant or something else that makes sense because this doesn't. Okay, doesn't it? So here are the puzzles and the challenges. Everyone is using this image and they believe that something can be gotten out of it, that somehow um, thinking of the bearded pan, uh, we also can understand better somehow the radiation or the radiative nature of various uh, bodies, celestial bodies or other bodies. Um, there are two questions here. What are the sources of these images and allegories? And what are the functions these images are supposed to play in the thought of early modern philosophers? So to the first question, uh, we have to think a bit of, of the relation between Renaissance and especially so-called Renaissance mythography compilations and dictionaries of myths and fables, or the ancient poets who everyone was reading, in fact, mostly Ovid and Virgil, Ovid's Metamorphosis, for example, features this pan very prominently, and the new science. And I'm going to show you a bit uh, something in this direction. To the second question, what are the functions these images are supposed to play? We will see that there are at least three functions. One is the mnemonic 
you will remember from now on every time you will see a radi radiation or radiative virtue um, the rays of sun filtered through the clouds and uh, you, know, you can see the rays somehow reaching the earth you will probably remember the beard of pan for a while and then there is this pedagogical meaning of the fables. Traditionally, they are used in school to teach kids something. Uh, and uh, what is good about the pedagogical meaning of, uh, about the, the using fables is that they can also be used at different levels. So sometimes fables are used to exclude audiences, to include audiences. There is a bit of a, a, a esoteric pedagogy at work in using fables. But we will see that the main use of the fables is heuristic because they put our imagination to work. Now, what are the sources? Where is Newton borrowing from? Now, the story in the secondary literature, our uh, interpreters of Newton and Bacon are saying that uh, the source is this, for example, Natalis Conti Mythologiae, a very popular book, a sort of dictionary of fables and interpretations, or other books of this kind. Conti is favorite because Conti also gives a philosophical interpretation of the whole business. And the philosophical interpretation, first chapter in Conti, is that the poem, the poets, fables, the creators of fables, fables themselves, are a sort of disguise for serious philosophy. That our philosophers, that before the philosophers, there was this, uh, uh, there was this truth which was hidden in some sort of uh, um, fable kind of uh, clothes. Because someone wanted to stop ordinary men from gaining access to such remarkable subjects, for if the unlettered were to misunderstand them, it would be easy for them to lose their religion when philosophical reasoning was freed of disguises in later time and a completely straightforward method of philosophizing was thus made known, few men understood that the stories were the ancient dwelling places, so to speak, or philosophy. So stories or fables are the ancient dwelling places of philosophy. That's why we are using fables, according to Conti, because they encode some of the philosophy of the ancients. Now, of course, that uh, and, and the challenge posing the mythographer is to unearth the true philosophy of the ancients unspoiled by the errors of the later sects, to go to the real Prisca Sapientia, which is disguised in this language of the fables. Now, of course, if we look at the preface to Bacon's The Sapientia Veterum, it looks very much like this. So Bacon claims that the most, most ancient times are buried in oblivion and silence. There is a veil separating us from the ancient truth. And second paragraph, I do certainly, for my own part, incline to this opinion that beneath no small, small number of the fables of the ancient poets, there lay from the very beginning a mystery and an allegory. It may be that my reverence for the primitive time carries me too far, but the truth is that in some of these fables, as well as in the very frame and texture of the story, as in the property of the names by which the persons that figure in it are distinguished, I find a conformity and connection with the thing signify so close and so evident that one cannot help believing such a significance to have been designed and meditated from the first and purposely shadow out. So fables are a production of the oldest ages, um, coming from Homer and Hesiod, passed down under a poetical form to the later generation of poets. They have a true meaning and we have to unearth. That's the preface to Bacon's little book. Um, Conti on the purpose of the fables, uh, it's also kind of similar, we will see with Bacon. Conti says that um, this is why we have decided that we ought to make a comprehensive classification of the stories of fables. Some reveal the secrets of nature, others reveal the inconstancy of fortune, still others attract us to virtue. So the idea is to look for the real meaning in these three categories, physical, the secrets of nature, moral, and perhaps also theological. So here is the case for uh, 
mythographers at the origin of the use of these images. I'm kind of not hearing anyone anymore. Are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Okay. people Sorry. are here. Just, yes, are, everyone was very silent, and I suddenly... You have my I full find, attention. I kind of found myself alone in the universe. Good, that's all right. Oh, sorry. That was not a good move. So, the case for the universe. People saying that Bacon and perhaps Newton are, are borrowing from Conti and the others. Here is another Tartari, another of these books. So, there are similarities of purposes. Both seem to want to unearth the ancient wisdom. And there are similarities of particular forms of allegorical interpretation. Uh, Conti mentions most of the images and uh, elements of the emblem of Pan that Bacon is constructing. Pan is the universe. The beard of Pan represents the celestial rays. Pan is red in the face, which represents the celestial fire. And Pan is a hunter, so knowledge is like the Venatio here. You have an, an emblem, Conti, Conti's book initially doesn't have drawings or engravings, but uh, Katari had, and then later edition of Conti's also had this uh, kind of images to help your mind remember the elements of these um, allegories. But here is the case against the mythographers, which I'm going to try to uh, substantiate. Uh, the theory of fables as carriers of ancient wisdom is much older than Conti and Cartari. In Renaissance, you find it in Erasmus, but you find it in Neoplatonists, and it has Neoplatonic and Stoic and descendants going all the way to the 6th century. Um, it's also very well known because it figures prominently in Ovid's Metamorphosis, or at least in some of the commentaries of Ovid's Metamorphosis. I'm not going into details, but if you're interested, we can discuss more about this. So somehow it's not the story of the mythographers. This is a much older story relating to the tradition of the Neoplatonist Prisca Sapientia, and fables are used in the same way in this tradition as carriers of hidden, encoded philosophy. And also, there are significant differences of details corresponding in, in Bacon, for example, or Newton, with respect to Cartari or Conti, corresponding to different cosmologies. So one funny little detail is that Bacon's pen is not at all red in the face, because, of course, Bacon denies that there is an element of fire. So that kind of element, that kind of element of the emblem of pen is out. Now, if we dismiss the mythographers as a main source, what are we left with? The state of the art is proposing two directions of interpretation. Neither of them is new. And Moss, on the humanist interpretation of the fables, according to this, we kind of read Bacon. She doesn't do that, but we can do that following her interpretation. We can make Bacon a Renaissance thinker. But then how about Newton? And there is this famous interpretation of uh, the fact that up to Bacon and a little bit beyond Bacon, um, there was this trope of knowledge as Venatio, as the hunt, which is more or less in the air through the mid 17th century, and then it disappears, and we should read it um, in this kind of interpretation. Now, my proposal is neither one or the other. Uh, my proposal is to draw your attention to some of Bacon's innovations and to claim that they are uh, relevant. Now, here is a kind of even more historical parenthesis that I'm going to try to speed up through because um, it's a bit too much, I suspect. But the point is that there is a general theory of how to deal with fables in the tradition. And the idea is that up to the Renaissance, there are, these are the four possible meanings of interpreting a fable. We can interpret the fable, let's say, hunt, the, the pan, sorry, to refer the fable of pan, to refer to natural or physical elements of the universe or astrological elements of the universe. We can interpret it historically to refer to historical elements. Uh, we can interpret it tropological, assigning to elements of the, the fable moral elements. And this is a typical interpretation in the Middle Ages. And then we can meet, read it as an allegory. What happens in the Renaissance is that C drops out, so there are no more tropological interpretations. And what we have 
is that fables are allegories to be read in these three ways, historically, physically, and morally. So fables are encoded truths, and what we have to extract from fables are historical truths, physical truths, and moral truths. For Could example, you the slides for size, Dana. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. For example, uh, the physical interpretation refers to what we saw already. Pan uh, beard referred to the celestial rays, and the, but the moral interpretation refers to hierarchy of virtue or the fact that Jupiter is the supreme ruler. And then the historical interpretation doesn't fit here, but other fables do have historical interpretations. Now, my claim is that Bacon's interpretation, it's not of this kind. He makes one step further in what I'm calling fixing the meaning of the allegory. So, for example, he's completely getting rid of, he's getting rid of the historical interpretation of Pan and potentially also the moral interpretation of Pan. And he's asking us to focus on the physical interpretation of Pan. Also, Bacon claims in the Sapientia Verum to use fables differently. And here is the quote. Parables or fables have been used in two ways, and which is strange for contrary purposes, for they serve to disguise and veil the meaning, and they serve also to clear and throw light upon it. To avoid dispute then, let us give up the former of these uses. That's very funny because it comes after the paragraphs I showed you before, where he seemed to say the same things as Conti or Cartari. And now he's completely diverging from that interpretation, saying, let's assume that they are not basically talking about ancient truth. Fables are a creation of the mind. Let us suppose that these fables were things without any definite purpose, made only for pleasure. So they don't have a, a hidden philosophical meaning intended from the very beginning, part of the Prisca Sapientia. Still, there remains a latter use. Why not using them this way? No force of wit can deprive us of that. Nor is there any man of ordinary learning that will object to the reception of it as a thing grave and sober and free from all vanity, of prime use to the sciences, and sometimes indispensable. I mean, the employment of parables as a method of teaching, whereby inventions that are new and abstruse find an easier passage into the understanding. Now, it would be interesting to discuss a bit with you, but my way of reading this paragraph is a way of saying, well, here are these interesting uh, emblems, allegories, stories that we all know. For a long time, we believe that they are encoding hidden meanings and the Prisca Sapientia. Let's suppose that they don't. We can still use them as vehicles of teaching. They can be of prime use to the sciences, and they can be sometimes indispensable, because that's the way to teach what I want you to, te what I want you to learn. So these are the things that are important here. They are of prime use to the sciences and sometimes indispensable. The employment of parables as a method of teaching in which I'm explaining very complicated things in such a way that they find an easier passage into the understanding. And Bacon's project to do that, it's not actually the Sapientia Veterum, but some later edition in the Augmentis Centiarum where he's giving examples of philosophy according to the ancient parables. And here he's rewriting his fable of Pan from the earlier De Sapientia Veterum. Here we are in the 1623, and Bacon is kind of winding up and knowing that he's going to die soon, and he has to put out as much as possible of his project, and therefore he becomes much more open. And he's rewriting the fable of Pan, and here is where he's describing the hunt of Pan. So Bacon's project of using fables to do philosophy is something I'm calling fixing the meaning and creating an emblem. Creating an emblem, the emblem of Pan, 
is done through assembling elements of the ancient fables, stories that we all know. We all know you 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 came to this talk knowing that Pan is half goat and half man and has a beard and whatever. So we still know some of these elements today. Even more, they were very well known to every educated reader in Bacon's time. What does it mean fixing the meaning? Well, you already saw that interpreting fables was kind of becoming more and more restrained to the allegorical sense, which had three different ways of dealing with it, physical uh, and moral and historical. I'm saying that you can do this even more by creating a set of stable and distinctive characteristics of the emblem of Pan and attributing them a precise, although not univocal meaning with precisely mnemonic and heuristic functions. So I can impart on your minds that uh, the ray, that, that the beard, the long beard of, pay, of Pan represent the celestial, the rays of the celestial objects, the fact that there are ways in which the sun, the moon, and the stars are acting at a distance through various kinds of virtue, which have a long range of action. One can still interpret this, because I didn't tell you what kind of action or how many kinds of actions or anything, so there is still room for interpretation, but the set of meanings is more or less given. Interpreting the emblem Explicatio means rehearsing and unfolding its meanings. And it is not an exercise for memory only, although its function is clearly mnemotechnic. So you can imagine when teaching in fables that pupils are attaching mnemonic content to elements and they are reciting to the teacher what they have uh, memorized in this way. But the uh, advantage of fables over other kinds of mnemonic exercises is that they are also addressing the imagination, so they have heuristic function. Now, the emblem of Pan is what we have discussed so far, but how about the emblem of the hunt of Pan and the art of discovery? Because the hunt of Pan is something else. Um, so, the hunt of Pan, and here we go into the philosophical issues. Is there an art of discovery? The Hunt of Pan refers to a particular episode where Pan, while hunting, discovered the hidden goddess Ceres, who, was, who went in hiding and this created dramatic effects on the earth. All the other gods were looking for Ceres and no one could find her. Pan was not necessarily looking for her, but he was a skilled hunter looking for prey now, Ceres is the goddess of plenty, so discovering the goddess of plenty is taken to mean the discovery of many arts, crafts, and sciences. So the skilled hunter looking for arts and sciences founds the very fountain of the arts and sciences. Okay, that's the story. There is a sort of craft knowledge and tacit knowledge involved in the Experiencia Literata. So what this fable of Pan, of the hunt of Pan is telling us is exactly this, that practicing the art or discovering the art of indication involves craft knowledge and tacit knowledge. And somehow the discoverer, the experimenter seems to discover things by accident, uh, by intuition, in a flash of inspiration. Well, that's similar with how Pan discovered Ceres. Can we spell out this tacit knowledge in an art? Uh, an art that others can follow. That's the challenge that Bacon is putting on the table. And he has a lot of philosophical precursors. One of them is Plato. So in a passage of Euthydemus, uh, we find this very interesting and very similar idea about the tacit aspects of hunting. So no part of actual hunting, says Socrates, covers more than the province of chasing and overcoming. And when they have overcome the creature they are chasing, they are unable to use it. The huntsmen or the fishermen hand it over to the caterers. And so it is too with the geometers, astronomers, and calculators. For these are also hunters in the way, since they are not in each case diagram makers by discoverers of the realities of things. So geometers 
are discoverers of the realities of things, but somehow they cannot use their discovery. And so not knowing how to use their prey, but only to hunt, I take it, they hand it over their discoveries to the dialecticians to use it properly. Now, I don't know what to say about this passage, apart from the fact that when I discover it, I thought that I'm reading Bacon here. So you have this art of hunting, which is similar with an art of discovery, which contains a lot of tacit knowledge involved in it, a lot of craft knowledge, so much craft knowledge that actually at the end of discovering a thing about nature, the craftsman doesn't quite know how to use it. So he needs the philosopher to come in and tell him what to do. Bacon would say, you need the interpretation of nature to tell you what to do with what you have discovered. In the dialogue uh, of Plato, the search is for that kingly art which itself sh shall know how to use it, what is acquired either in making or in ch chasing. And there are other references in Plato. The best is in Philebus, where the Prometheus fable refers to the acquisition of dialectics. Again, the discovery is more like a theft, a hunt. Looks accidental, but it's in fact due to skill and craft. So what does it mean, like a hunt? Well, one thing that is important is that for Bacon, Penn is not the only hunter. In a paragraph from the same uh, passage in the Augmentis Centiarum, he's saying that every natural action, every motion and process of nature is nothing else than a hunt. For the sciences and arts, hunt after the works. Human counsel hunt after their ends. And all things in nature hunt after their food, which is like hunting for prey, or after their pleasures, which is like hunting for recreation. So hunting, the hunt, is a universal process of nature, which appears at every level in various motions and processes. So the process of knowledge acquisitions displays a kind of universal form. And the form is a form of intentionality and directionality. So this form of hunt has a kind of intention and directionality, which can be recognized in particular motions and processes of nature. And this is when Bacon says that the investigator of nature has to imitate nature and works with it. And this is why skill and craft knowledge for Bacon do not really lead to accidental discovery. Discoveries are a result of experience, or a result of, to go back to the passage we begin with, of that sagacious experience and the universal knowledge of nature, a practical knowledge of nature. So, where Bacon really innovates with respect to all his predecessors is to put so much into this emblem of the hunt of Pan, um, so much that refers to a philosophical problem of tacit knowledge, craft knowledge, and also of the relationship between this tacit knowledge and knowledge, properly speaking. Now, how was this received in the 17th century? Here, I don't have time to do more history, but the idea of, at this point, perhaps, would be to go back a bit to do a bit more history. I just put on two columns the kinds of reception that we can find. And one interesting reception, which was totally unknown to me, but surprisingly not only to me, but other people, to other people as well, is that there is a particular reception of Bacon in the 17th century as a mythographer on his own right, as a creator of emblems. And the pan that I've been showing you now and then is from this book, Jean Baudouin, Recueil d'Emblèmes Divers, uh, published in 1638 in Paris, which begins with Bacon has put me to work on this art of emblem. And at the emblem of pan, he's transcribing basically what Bacon said. Another one who is transcribing what Bacon says in the uh, emblem of Pan, of the hunt of Pan, with even 
uh, even more interestingly connecting, connecting it with the discovery of new sciences is Marine Mersenne in the Traité de l'Harmonie Universelle. And in England, there is a strong uh, tradition of Bacon's as an innovator of mythography in George Sandys' uh, interpretation of Ovid, but also in Gilbert Watts' in advancement of learning. You see on the margin Gilbert Watts referring to Bacon's creation of new emblems. Um, we can say, see also that there are there is another way of, of dealing with Bacon's hunt of Pan, namely the people who read Bacon and were really puzzled about the uh, nature of the Experientia Literata and tried to come with their own metaphors to update the Bacon's, to update the emblem and to update the metaphorical meanings connected with the emblems. For, for example, Leibniz has a long paragraph explaining that Bacon's art of discovery is like an art of deciphering in the 1670s. And then uh, Thomas Pratt in the history of the Royal Society explaining at large how Experientia Literata is functioning acknowledges its a tacit knowledge um, aspect and its craft knowledge aspect by saying that the art of discovery it's a bit like the art of polite behavior it has a lot of rules but they are not spelled out it's like decency in human life we are talking about the polite society of the 17th century not about today's world and then john beale uh, is saying that the art of discovery is a kind of philosophical algebra referring to hook and to Wilkins and Hooke's project for a universal language and a philosophical algebra. And I see this updating of the emblems uh, with a kind of updating one sees when passing from the brain is like an electrical circuit in the 19th century, to the brain is like a telephone company, or to the brain is like a computer. The meaning, again, here we have metaphor but it's more than metaphor. The idea, the pedagogical idea and the heuristic idea remains in these metaphors and they are taught to students in view of the same kinds of things that Bacon had in mind when he invented his emblem of the hunt of Pan. Now, just a very brief uh, last point on historiographic issues. We see that texts are high, have a high sensitivity to the context and the question which is the right context. Um, by looking at various kinds of contexts, I have discovered Jean Baudouin and Samuel de Fermat and, and Marcin's reference to Bacon as a mythographer or what I'm working on right now, Sandy's of its mythography, which is again, a kind of Baconianism that somehow it escaped the attention of people working on Bacon's reception in the 17th century. Texts are also high, highly sensitive to historiographic frameworks. Which historiographic framework I'm applying to understand the text I'm looking at depends, uh, I mean, that the result can be very different. Different historiographic frameworks allow reading a text in a different context. We have seen, for example, the huge difference between reading Bacon as an early modern and reading Bacon as a Renaissance thinker. If we apply the scientific revolution context uh, framework, historiographic framework, again, uh, you, you miss a number of things. How about switching from one historiographic framework to another? Well, switching from one historiographic framework to another, I would say, allow us to read a text in different contexts. And this often leads to spotting either unknown texts, such as the Baconian mythographies, or unspotted similarities be between authors, such as we see, we saw tonight, Bacon and Newton, a similarity that still has to be uh, explored. And I call this perspectival contextualism, a uh, sort of attitude of methodological tolerance, which allows the reader to shift between different historiographic frameworks without dismissing the old and old-fashioned historiographic frameworks, as for example, the big framework of the scientific revolution, which many people have abandoned. So the tentative conclusions of my three sides of the problems, of the problem on the historical side, we have seen that the early moderns used emblems in their quest for knowledge, 
In this, they drew on a wide number of sources. Emblems are not just a metaphorical way of speaking, they are elements with pedagogical and heuristic value in need of further investigation. On the philosophical side of my problem, emblems are of essence for understanding the early modern conception of discovery, which in turn are interlinked with the emergence of science. And this perhaps means that understanding these theories of discovery might still be relevant today. And on the historiographical side, we need to exercise a perspectival contextualism to recover some of our missing codes of reading and some of the missing contexts. And that's it. Thank you. Let me just get rid of this so that I Thank can see much, at least Sarah. some of you. Is there a way to clap? Lovely. Thank you. Um, so we are not going to take a break, I think. We move to questions now. And um, you, you can just write a comment or start asking a question. It's your choice. May I make a comment first, perhaps? Do you hear me? Yes, of course. Yes, I do. Well, the comment, well, the comment is that this is absolutely fantastic in some sense because I'm logged on from London and I would have never thought that I would be able to attend a seminar in this way in Bucharest. So maybe you want to go online with your seminar series, irrespective of the viral crisis, because that allows us, uh, who are very far away, to log on and participate in it. So that's, this is one of the advantages of the crisis, which should be perhaps mentioned. So it was lovely. But since I'm also speaking, may I ask you something? Do you hear me? Yes, of course. Yes. Um, when you're talking about this pan and how to understand it, what does it mean? and you distinguish this uh, mnemonic, pedagogic, and heuristic role of it. Uh, on the examples which you mentioned, like especially the long beard and the hair and that kind of esoteric and weird stuff, I was thinking that maybe this pan also can be viewed somewhat differently in the sense that to me it represented something which is a scientific problem for which at that time one could not find a solution or an answer. So it is just a means to express a problem for which there is no solution, cannot be conceptualized in the available scientific terms. I mean, think of the beard, which you said would be something which connects the planets. But to me, that sounds like uh, the expression yes. of the problem of uh, gravitation. And it was a problem. It was a problem for Newton. Newton couldn't find a solution to it. So we know that this is a deep issue. And so I'm, I'm willing to consider this pen in some respects as the, the vehicle through which a problem is formulated for which there is no scientific concepts available to express. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just totally I'm just agree. I'm just I'm just wondering agree. what you think of this and how it would be related I, I will, to these three roles. Yeah, I will put this to the heuristic. I will put this to the heuristic aspect um, of of the fable. So in this sense, they are heuristic, exactly in the sense in which you are saying that they are basically giving us a problem or a riddle, and with uh, by. By contrast with the Renaissance way of giving us problems and riddles, for this, Bacon doesn't have a solution. And that's a big difference because usually uh, Renaissance authors are giving us riddles for which they do have solutions, or at least they believe that some people had solutions before them, the ancients. And here you have this projective meaning of the riddle or problem in which we do understand that we don't have a solution. So it's exactly what you're saying. This is what I call the heuristic 
May I jump on this immediately? No. Just with a very short remark. Yeah, but I, there, I, I there, is a, just a, there is a comment on this. I mean, Dan Zeman has a comment, I think, on this. Okay. Or no? Dan? I, I, Hi, sorry. Uh, okay, go ahead then. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not about this. Go it's, a, ahead, then. it's a different thing. It's not about this, sorry. Okay, then, so then, may then I make the... let me just finish. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not happy about uh, somehow subsuming this under the heuristic law. The heuristics to me is mm. some sort of a method. And this is what I described is not really a, okay. a, a method or it's not concerning a method. It is a problem, a lack, a lack of okay. concepts, yeah. lack of theory, lack of understanding. And in despair, we can't do better but designing some sort of a weird hand who has this beard, which uh, of course has nothing mm -hmm. to do with what we want to understand, but well, it does have something to do with it because this is the way we somehow express our despair and the lack of scientific understanding and theory. So I wouldn't classify it under heuristics. That's just a friendly suggestion. Okay. It's a different thing. Okay. Suggestion taken. I'll think about it. Yeah. So ne next question uh, or a comment actually comes from Dan Zeman. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So I was just wondering uh, uh, about one specific point that you made, which is, I mean, one of your interests in this talk, which if I understand correctly, is that uh, to kind of try to see what's the connection between the experiencia literata and the, uh, I don't know, I guess, the organ thing, like the more sophisticated kind of knowledge, mm -hmm. the principal yeah. knowledge. And, yeah. uh, well, I don't know if you uh, have looked into this, but uh, nowadays, and uh, especially in philosophy, in analytic philosophy, there's there's this topic of the knowledge how versus knowledge that question. Uh, so that has a lot to do with, the uh, you know, how exactly we combine the knowledge that we get by just having performing according to our abilities or uh, training and so on and so forth with how exactly to express that knowledge in propositional form would that be something that uh, might shed some light on this issue or do you think it's completely hopeless no it is. i mean this this story of knowledge mm -hmm. or knowledge that was kind of taken over by historians of science for mm -hmm. a long time now in this idea of craft knowledge or um, right. Or yeah, that is basically called craft knowledge. Simon Smith, and there is a whole gang of people doing this, uh, which which is a kind of uh, it, it's a kind of uh, yeah that that there is a lot of knowledge coming from experience from the materials. There is a lot about the material science behind craft knowledge, um, and that can be spelled out. It can be transformed into propositional knowledge by acting experiment so the, the the main thesis of the craft knowledge business is that although there is a big gap between tacit craft knowledge and traditional knowledge by acting out experiments and trying out recipes you can unload the tacit knowledge behind yeah. now i think that bacon is very relevant in this because he sees the <clears throat> experiential literata and morganum as two sides of a kind of process, of a kind of, I don't know, I, I'm reluctant to say two sides of a coin because the sides of a coin are complementary. They are helping somehow each other. Right. Um, and, and that relates also with, with the idea that somehow, so uh, what I'm saying is that, that uh, Bacon recognized that there are two kinds of knowledge there but was constantly trying to show that this knowledge are part of the same thing and was trying to find ways to put them together. So ideally for Bacon, a science, a properly developed science, we don't have properly developed science according to his schema, a science will have both theoretical propositional knowledge principles, syllogistic organization coming from principles to the last truth, and at every step, practical outcome and results okay okay thanks yeah. okay so th the next question comes from uh, doina christina russo yes thank you very much um and thank you Hi, Dana. Dana. 
<laughs> Hello from the Netherlands, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, so I, I said I have one question, but I have actually two. I hope I'm allowed to ask them both. Sure. Thanks. And so a tiny, tiny brief comment before that. So I, I had the impression that you are talking about all the levels you explained in the beginning. So the more methodological, historical, and maybe it would be useful to make it a bit clear when you're talking about what because sometimes i wasn't sure if you are referring to the methodological part or to the physical content of the fable so if you're planning to write the paper maybe this is something you could think about but this is just the time so first question when you talked about functions you mentioned a few times images, emblems, and as we know, Bacon is so much against the use of images in science. So I was wondering how are these two things staying together, whether we can use images at a certain level, but maybe not at another one, because the very critical approach to images is in the Novum Organum, so maybe there's a difference mm -hmm. there. Um, shall I ask the second question or? Well, I can respond very quickly to the first one. Uh, by images, you mean drawings or diagrams or engravings? I mean and yes, something but... that goes straight to the imagination mm -hmm. and inflates the imagination. And I think all these things, images, emblems, mm -hmm. are actually working mainly about Right. Um, I would say that Bacon is not a, at all against working upon imagination with emblems. Uh, it's actually what he's doing. That's how you do when you teach. When you teach, I have first to catch your imagination. And from the imagination, the image that I'm creating goes into your memory and it's stored there. And if I'm continuing the teaching, the pupil has to kind of rehearse and produce uh, with the help, produce the content of the memory. These are mm -hmm. the first stages of teaching. And knowledge begins once you understand that this is just the basis for something else and you understand how to use these things yourself. So this is the main, one of the main uses of the ambulance. The second is this okay, what I called heuristic, uh, and to, to this I add what Miklos called the problem, the open-ended. So my uh, surmise why Bacon is eliminating engraving and drawings from his, why he's not putting there a, a pen in the, on, on his page, is that those do not have open-ended uh, questions at the, at the end. So he is creating emblems with words, to leave all the time an open-ended um, question, problem, something that I'm going to think of. So I'm not only remembering now and forever that Pan's beard represents celestial rays, but I'm going to ask, okay, in what way is the beard representing the celestial way, rays? Are these rays magnetic? Are these rays gravitational? What the hell is that? Okay, so he's sending me thinking with this. Okay, so images person. would be not open ending and okay. Um, I like this. And the second question was actually related to this open ending thing and what you said about the metaphor of hunting. Because in the examples you gave, it sounded very teleological, very much focused on the end. And we know Bacon doesn't really like this final causes idea and how do these stay together with the open ending so what are we hunting we are kind of so there is a kind of teleology in the fact that as you know bacon seems to 
strongly believe that my mind cannot not think. Mm -hmm. The intellect is forever unquiet, so I'm thinking by default. And this is a way, this is similar with the hunt hunting for prey or the lion hunting for a rabbit. There is a, there is a teleology in, in the process of knowledge. But the process of knowledge is distorted, so it's I I I have to to fix it. But the, the teleology is there. It's just that I sh that the, that the the end point is not really spelled out. I'm a bit I'm hunting a bit blindly because my mind is distorted. I'm getting all sorts of conflicting informations. So all I know is that I'm striving to knowledge, and there is a tendency to strive to knowledge. But it's a bit like groping in the dark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. So, uh, Thank uh, you. if we move to the next uh, person on our list, uh, we have uh, Andrei Marashoyu. Andrei Marashoyo said he had also a question. Oh, hi. Um, can you hear me well now? Yeah. Hi. Okay. Well, thanks for the talk. Yes, this I has do. been positively wonderful. Um, just sort of a simple minded question, I guess. Um, if we're talking about experiencia litigata, I was just wondering who it is that has it or who it is that possesses it. Because on the one hand, I. I I hazily remember Bacon saying something like this in the advancement of science that look without museums and archives and stuff like that, we couldn't deposit all the knowledge we reap of nature or something of the sort. So that sounds sort of communitarian. Uh, that sounds as though the community is sort of essentially involved yeah. in knowledge. And you did mention sort of crafts or the kind of tacit knowledge that an individual acquires and their sort of growing expertise as being part of a community, right? Um, but on the other hand, the intuitions, the discovery as, uh, uh, you know, this sort of uh, uh, insight and so on, these seem to be sort of individual acts, right? So it seems as though it's the individual who would be having this experiencia litigata rather than the community. And so maybe this is a false dilemma, I don't know, but I'm just wondering what you think. No, it's a very good question. And it's actually at the very core of Bacon's program because, uh, okay, the question is how do I make what looks like a ultimate individual experience, the experience of discovery, as if by accident, your subject, not mine, the aha story that you were telling us about, how do I make this communitarian? And I have to make it communitarian because if we don't put all our results together, then we don't have the database to do the next step, which is the interpretation of nature. So it's exactly what is at stake here. How do I move from uh, the individual hand to spelling out the rules? And I think that that's what that's, I didn't talk about. That's how Bacon does by spelling out those modes, he calls them, of ways or ways of the experiencia literata. So he's trying to go precisely in this direction to say, well, we can somehow transform all this, not in uh, propositional knowledge per se, but in methodology of experimentation. And it's only here, now to respond to Doina, that methodology comes in. In everything I talked tonight, there was no methodology yet, just you know, prefigured in the modes of experiencia literata. So the idea is that somehow I can tell you the story of my discovery by telling you how I got to that discovery. And these modes of, of doing proper discoveries are transitive. They can be replicated. They also do something else which I didn't discuss today, which is Bacon's idea that, well, in a way, analogical thinking is the worst thing when we can apply. I mean, analogy is the very root of our errors. Is, a way, is there a way to discipline the analogy? And the answer is yes, through correct methodologies. So if I'm giving you the correct experimental methodology, and I'm giving you the paths that are the correct experimental paths, 
you can in the laboratory do your own hunt and achieve some knowledge at the end of it. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, I think next is uh, Grigore Vida. Uh, you need to uh, you need to turn on your microphone, Grigore. Hi everyone, do you hear me? We hear you. Hi, yes, we do. Okay, so thanks, Dana, for the talk. Um, I've been studying lately the problem of uh, analogy of nature in Newton. And I was wondering whether this could uh, fit somehow in you in your story. For instance, Maguire claims uh, it is tied up with the metaphysics about the great chain of being. But besides that, uh, as you know, uh, Newton has this strange idea that uh, space is the sensorium of God. And the latest interpretation of this is uh, that he's uh, making an analogy of nature from the sensorium of humans to the sensorium of God. I, I think this is uh, this interpretation is mistaken. Yeah. I think it's a metaphor and it, it occurred to me during your talk whether this might be an emblem. What would you say about this? Or does it have to be mythological, this emblem? What would you say if the sensorium of God would be an emblem? Um, I'm, I'm absolutely comfortable with saying that it is an emblem because uh, if we take Bacon's uh, claim that it doesn't matter what was the purpose of the story, we can use the story to create an emblem. What he does, for example, in the New Atlantis, he's creating a number of emblems which do not have mythological, immediate mythological significations. So uh, it's it's all right to create an emblem out of, of almost everything. But the only problem that you need to, I mean, I don't know about the sensorium day, probably it works. So I think what you need to have, it's my first condition, namely that we all know the story. We have to know the elements of the story as we know the elements of the hundred pan. If we don't know anything, uh, if that's just obscure neoplatonic neoplatonic metaphysic, then you cannot use it as an emblem because your listeners won't know what you want to say. So I would, if if the if the image you're using uh, respect this condition that it uses very very um, well known elements. Then it can be an emblem if it even if it doesn't come from Ovid or Virgil. Yes, yes. So the sensorium story is not actually tied to Neoplatonic metaphysics, but to the actual sensorium of humans. So in this sense, uh, it could be regarded as being known by at least the majority mm -hmm. of people. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, ne um, next we have uh, a question or more questions, I don't know, from uh, Dr. Pruna Bretone. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry, my camera is not working for some reason, but do you hear me? We do hear you. Yes, we do. Um, then I wanted to go back to the first or the second slide uh, where Bacon uh, says something about being led by the hand. I was struck by that image. Could you elaborate mm -hmm. a bit? Because it seems to be something rather passive. Um, but the context, if I remember well, was not um, completely supporting the image or to my mind. So that's a that's a famous image of how you can find your way in in, in the labyrinth of nature, and yes, there are three ways. Actually, too, um, sometimes there, there are three ways in which you can go through the labyrinth of nature. One is blindly, and that's the way of the empiric. And Bacon is very much against the ways of the empiric, who is blindly experimenting and going through the labyrinth of nature. 
And the ideal way of going through the labyrinth of nature is that someone is turning on the light. And that is the light of the axioms that you find in the interpretation of nature, which is in the Novum Organum, if the Novum Organum would have been finished. But as we know, the Novum Organum was never finished. It mm -hmm. was far from finished. And Bacon doesn't have interpretation of nature. So the best thing he has in between these two extremes is the Experientia Literata, which, however, it's not a kind, so the, the image of being led by the hand in the dark, it's also going in the direction, actually, thank you, that goes in the direction of Andrei's question. That's another intersubjective element of, of discovery, that somehow, uh, although I'm doing experiments and I'm hunting and whatever, I'm doing this with the help, with some help. For example, some Bacon's help in spelling out the rules of experimenting, the, the ways of experimenting, or the help that I got when I learned the methodology of experimentation in the laboratory. All this is being led by the hand. I'm not doing on my own. I'm applying or I'm, I'm following the guidance of previous experimenters. In this way, it is being led by the hand. But that's, a, of course, a, that's a stoic image. Uh, philosophy is for Stoics, for Seneca, uh, doing philosophy, it's a kind of being led by the hand of another. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it on my own. I, I'm never alone. I need, a, I need a friend, I need a philosopher, I need a master, I need someone. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is very interesting because later on in the 18th century, uh, Bacon will be used um, especially to so sometimes to highlight the fact that the philosopher uh, has to um, walk alone, has to see through his own eyes and not mm. by the hand. So it will be really turned yes, the other way around. Yes, yeah. no, I know. And it, that's actually that's worse in the 19th century and Bacon becomes the lonely philosopher. Mm -hmm. That's a fabrication of the late, the probably late 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. When people have ceased uh, reading um, the Augmentis and uh, natural histories, and they were focusing solely in the, on book one of the Novum Organum, mm -hmm. and half of the book two. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm waiting for uh, either a message or someone who wants to ask a question to directly turn on the microphone and speak Shout. But you oh, really it looks like I have perceived you. Oh. oh, okay, Rudy. I don't really have a question. Uh, I, it, w it was very interesting talk, and thank you for that. Also for breaking this otherwise quite monotonous days. Um, I have to say, I, I, I found the unexpected analogies, and now that I think about that kind of to be expected analogies, uh, with uh, the characterization of the um, method of discovery in uh, in Gaston D's um, mm -hmm. uh, logic, in the fourth part of the logic, uh, when he talks about method, uh, and he talks, he characterizes the method as a process of hunting. So actually, I just sent you an email asking if you if oh. you have any written no. version of this paper I can quote in a paper I'm writing. <laughs> But uh, please do all that's fantastic, yeah. Thank you. And then we should talk. I, I should read the passages and then we should discuss more about it. Perfect. I send you uh passages in question then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Anyone else? The last call. <laughs> yes.
If not, then uh, uh, thank you very much, Dana, for your talk tonight. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for, for coming, for being present. <laughs> And uh, I don't know what uh, our plans are for our next uh, meeting, for our next seminar. Is it going to be next Wednesday? Do we have an uh, invite? Yes, well, I, I don't guest? see Andreas here. Andreas, uh, Andreas has, um, Sorry, Andreas had some technical issues, and um, I don't think we are going to be able to have our next meeting here on Google um, Hangout. Maybe we should switch on Zoom for war one week and then be back if Andreas accept this. All right. Uh, so you we have Andreas your emails, Dana. All right, I, I will. So, so we have Andreas next week. The question is how, under what form? Yes. Good, excellent. So that's we have next week, Andreas Blanc on common notions in 17th century. Okay. Okay. All right, we will do a list. I see some people wanting to join for future talks. We do a list and uh, let us know and, and we, we put everyone on the list. I mean, everyone who wants on the list for future seminars. Thank you very much. Right, and we also have the Facebook page of the seminar. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you again, Dana. We'll see each other next week okay see you safe next week all of you bye bye thank you bye 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 goodbye bye bye bye, bye. 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 bye.